out of the three major macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, the only one for which there is literally no uh, scientifically established human uh, dietary requirement is carbohydrates. The world that we live in today is so dramatically different than the world of our prehistoric ancestors. We have challenges that we face in, in our modern industrialized environment that are unprecedented in all of our evolutionary history. We are dealing with a level of toxicity in our air, water, and food supply. We're dealing with GMOs. We're dealing you know, with all kinds of things. And people tend to not take those things into account. Nora Gadgadis, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And, and welcome Keto Campers. So uh, it's great to be here. I love your work. I have your books right here. I also have your audio book, but I wanted to show the YouTuber, people watching on YouTube, that I do have a physical copy and your, your books have really made a big difference in my life. And we'll get into a lot of the work that you've done, a lot of the work that you're doing, but I'd love for you to start off with, with this question. How does somebody go from fearing fat, eating low fat, spending some time in Canada with wolves and having a whole different perspective <laughs> on fat? Well, you know, in experience is the great teacher, right? Um, it started off with, with experience and things that just sort of weren't adding up based on what I had always been taught to believe about, about nutrition. You know, I've got a now close to 40 year background in, in studying nutrition, nutritional science. And, and early on, I was bought into the low fat uh, paradigm. And then uh, I had this opportunity to spend a whole summer living less than 500 miles from the North Pole with a, with a family of wild wolves. Uh, it's uh, Northern Ellesmere Island. And uh, it was a fairly industrial strength religious experience for me. But in the process of getting up there, you know, I knew I was going to sp be spending a long time away from all of the salads and the vegetable juices and things like that that I had been enjoying. And I was thinking, how am I supposed to, you know, what's this going to do to my health to not have access, you know, to fruits and vegetables for an entire summer, right? And, uh, and you know, as I traveled on up there, because, you know, we brought some, uh, you know, boil and bag dinners and things with us. And we also did some hunting while we were, while we were up there. But, you know, there, there wasn't much. We had a few onions along, you know, a, you know, a smattering of carrots, which didn't last very long, you know, that we would stir fry into some of the meat that we hunted and whatever, but um, went through a lot of butter, you know. Uh, but, Anyway, on the way up there, we passed through an Inuit community um, called Resolute Bay. And at the time, there were about 200 residents, uh, mostly Inuit. And, um, you know, they, at the time, back in 1991, were leading a fairly subsistence lifestyle, about 80% subsistence. Uh, it wasn't that they didn't like store-bought food. Um, there was a store in Resolute that was about the size of the space you see me sitting in. <laughs> Uh, it was about this big, you know, and it doubled as the post office and, you know, whatever else. And, you know, the, the processed foods and non-perishables and, and the few limp veggies that came in on the Twin Otter plane every week or two, you know, they were expensive. And so people there really didn't have, didn't have money to spend. So they spent most of their time hunting and, and uh, fishing. And, uh, and that's mostly what they did. And the community seemed extremely healthy to me. Uh, it was a dry community. In other words, alcohol was not allowed, uh, you know, anywhere uh, on that island. And so, you know, they, they had the advantage of not being tempted by that either. Um, but, uh, you know, the kids were bright and inquisitive and playing on the swing sets at one o'clock in the morning when it was bright daylight out, you know, because it's 24 hour daylight in the summer up there. And I'm thinking, huh, you know, everybody, I, I wasn't seeing obesity, um, like you see oftentimes on native reservations here where people are fed according to government guidelines, you know, uh, by and large. Um, you want to know what the food pyramid is going to do for you, go to a native reservation and look around, you know, really. It's, it's, it's genocidal, really. It's, it's inexcusable. So I was scratching my head a lot. It, it niggled at me. You know, these people look good. They seem, and hey, they've got permafrost and nothing grows around, especially around Resolute, nothing grows. It's frost, chatter, chale everywhere. They usually have to travel long ways away to hunt. 
And uh, anyway, then I get to Ellesmere, which is considerably more beautiful and lush, but there really isn't anything edible in terms of plants. And there was evidence of, uh, you know, ancient human uh, cultures that had lived there and thrived there uh, for thousands of years. And, um, and I'm scratching my head again. I'm thinking, where are the veggies? You know, where were they getting any of that? I know there's some areas of the Arctic where the, uh, you know, detractors of ketogenic say, well, you know, they ate berries and they ate this. There were no berries up there. None of that stuff was available. There were no edible plant foods. And, um, and so anyway, uh, I found myself within very short order, strangely craving fat. And it, at first it really bugged me. It's like, Ooh, you know, like that, that, that butter really looks good to me or, you know, um, and I w found myself noshing on, cause we brought a lot of stuff like nuts, nut butters, um, salami, lots of cheese, stuff that was going to keep in a cold environment, you know, for a long time so that we would have an extra supply of food and energy. And I never thought of any of those things as health foods. And actually I still don't think of a lot of those things as health foods, but it was, what was very strange was that I went, from eating an extremely high, you know, carbohydrate diet, I was doing, you know, pasta and rice, and I was doing, you know, um, I was doing all kinds of, you know, veggies, including starchy veggies, and you know, all that kind of thing, to eating very low uh, carbohydrate, for the most part, with the, except for the occasional bit of onion in my food and whatever. And, uh, and I, over the course of that summer, being very well bundled against the cold, you know, I lost like 25 pounds that summer and craving fat like crazy. And uh, I got so lean, in fact, that I, um, when I got off the plane and hugged my best friend, they said, did you do this on purpose? <laughs> you know, it's like I had really, I had really, you know, gotten lean and I had gotten almost no exercise that summer at all. Sat around watching wolves do what they do, and when we followed them, we followed them on four wheelers. The ground was very hummocky; it was very uneven. It was very hard to get around on foot, so we generally relied on four wheel vehicles to follow them. And then when we were at the den, they didn't like us walking around; it, it upset them. So if we sat still and you know maintained a passive curiosity, they were totally cool with us being there. But as soon as we got uh, stood up and started walking around, they didn't like that. So you know, it wasn't a lot of movement. And that niggled at me, you know, it, it bothered me. I didn't know where to put that based on what I expected would have happened with what I did that summer. And of course, not long after I got back, I stumbled across the work of Weston Price and began thinking more in ancestral terms. And I, you know, it was like being gobsmacked with a, with a big sack of wet cement between the eyes. And then I thought, okay, I'm onto something here, but he's really talking about the Neolithic. And I, you know, knew well enough to know that the majority of our evolutionary sojourn as a species was not spent during the Neolithic, right? We, we, the world was a very different place before what we call the end of the last ice age, which is kind of a misnomer. But And so I w was compelled to dig back further. And I realized for, you know, good 2.6 million years before the end of the last ice age, we had shared the planet um, with very uh, different, uh, with you know, with a much larger and uh, more varied subset of extremely large herbivores we now call megafauna. And there were at least 120 additional species of megafauna on the planet that are now gone and disappeared in more or less the blink of an eye. And really, the bigger the animal, the higher the body fat. And that's what we hunted preferentially for, you know, most of the time that we have been a developing species. And, um, you know, when people think of, a lot of people in the so-called paleo sphere, you know, that's where I kind of got my start. But my very first book had the subtitle Beyond the Paleo Diet because I saw its limitations. I recognize it as the only rational starting place in terms of figuring out what kinds of foods would have been consistently available to our evolving species as, as you know, a bit of a litmus as to what our nutritional requirements might be and how our physiology evolved and all of those things. But, uh, you know, in my mind, uh, 
it's not a, you know, just because our ancestors did something isn't necessarily a good enough reason to do the same thing. Right. Which is where I decided to, you know, well, how do I know? And I thought longevity research might be a really useful way of, of cross pollinating these, these principles to figure out what might be optimal for us, you know, and what of those principles were optimal and what of those principles might not have been. Now, you know, it kind of leads us back a little bit to Weston Price, because even though I felt like he didn't go back far enough in his, you know, he couldn't, you know, he had what he had at the time that he had it. And I envy him to Helen Beck that he had the ability to be able to experience so many tr traditional uh, and, um, you know, what he called so-called primitive cultures that were thriving throughout the world at that time that are gone now. I mean, you couldn't have done what he did before he did it, and you couldn't have done what he did after he did it. He had the perfect window of opportunity. But in the end, um, you know, he went all over the world looking at all these different cultures and we had all these different diets and whatever else and found extraordinary health among persons in these, in these cultures that were doing things the old way of doing them. Um, and a, what a lot of people took away from that, including some of his, you know, biggest spokespeople, is the idea of, well, just eat real food and it's all good, right? As long as it, you know, grew out of the ground, it was natural, whatever, it's all good, as long as it's natural. And to me, there's no rational basis for that assumption. And, and in his mind, there wasn't either. Because he asked himself another question that was a really key question. Among the healthiest people groups that I studied in my 10 years and 100,000 miles of travel, what did all the healthiest people that I studied have in common in terms of their diets? Well, there were two things that he found that were consistent throughout. Number one, uh, they all consumed as many animal source foods as were available to them. Uh, they didn't all have access to plant foods, uh, but they all consumed as many animal source foods as they had available to them in the greatest variety possible. You know, And uh, in other words, no vegan cultures anywhere. And as hard as he tried to find that and as much as he wanted to find that. No such thing. The second thing that he discovered was that among the healthiest, most robust people that had the healthiest children, healthiest babies, you know, best mental health, best structural health, and you know, in terms of their dentition and their skeletal structure and everything else, fewest birth defects, he, what he found is that, uh, that all of them without exception found the, the most important, venerated, and sought after foods were those that were highest in fat and fat soluble nutrients. And therein, in my mind, lies the fundamental basis, the, the kind of the structural architecture, if you will, for a health optimized diet for literally every human being on earth. Not that everybody needs to eat tons of meat or whatever else, but that animal source foods are of necessity part of the equation. And the fats, you know, the fats that I'm talking about from these cultures were almost exclusively animal source fats and fat soluble nutrients. That those are an essential part of the equation also. I don't care what the so-called American Heart Association <laughs> says or whatever else. You know, uh, history uh, and the you know, data from history just simply proves them wrong. And the essentiality of so many of these nutrients proves them wrong. So, uh, including cholesterol, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I knew I was onto something, and I also knew I was onto something when I realized that nature wouldn't have been so stupid as to make us exclusively dependent on something as volatile and unreliable as glucose as a primary source of fuel, that we're designed to run on more than one thing, and that fat would be the other part of the equation. And it made so much more sense to me that fat would have been, you know, um, a fat-based metabolism would have been the natural metabolic state of humankind. And so my most recent book, Primal Fat Burner, basically expands on these hypotheses, you know, that number one, it was dietary fat and particularly the fat of animals that ultimately made us, you know, human in the way that, in the ways that seem to matter most, um, certainly vis-a-vis -vis our brain size as, as a species and how rapidly our, our brains encephalize, how rapidly our brains grew unprecedented in nature. And number two, that a fat-based metabolism is actually the natural metabolic state of humankind, and that glucose was really only meant to be the auxiliary, you know, source of fuel. 
uh, and and uh, you know used you know sporadically here and there, but fairly easy uh, to maintain adequate amounts of glucose to use as we need. You know if you're if you're operating on a fat-based metabolism, that's th that should not be a problem for the vast majority of people. And if it is, it's not that they have a carb deficiency; it's that there's some other underlying issue that they need to, you know, that they need to address in order to be able to adopt the more successful and advantaged metabolic state. So, well said. Well, that's a great introduction to what we're going to get into because a, a lot of people they are confused because they feel like that carbohydrates are essential to human beings, right? And um, they get confused this way. They, they believe that eating, that we need to get our glucose from actually eating the carbohydrates versus the body's ability, like you just said, to manufacture it. Could you explain the difference there in depth? Well, part of what I'll, ex I'll, I'll, I'll explain too is that we have to realize that, you know, a lot of people believe this and I, I don't fault them for believing that because that is the kind of the conventional mainstream mantra. And it's the conventional mainstream mantra in large part because there are enormous vested interests in carbohydrate-based foods, right? They're, they're extremely cheap and easy to produce. They're almost immeasurably profitable. And, and, um, um, and if you're going to eat a diet like that, it makes you almost you know, perpetually hungry. So, you know, who benefits from that? Well, you know, shake, uh, swing a dead cat and see how many transnational corporate you know, interests that you hit. So that's part of the issue. But the fact of the matter is when you look at textbooks of human, in a medical textbooks of human physiology and whatever else you find again and again, that um, out of the three major macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, the only one for which there is literally no uh, scientifically established human uh, dietary requirement is carbohydrates. Uh, we can manufacture all the glucose we need and all the glycogen we need from a combination of, you know, protein and fat in the diet. And uh, when you're not dependent on glucose, you're not going to burn through your glycogen as fast. So, you know, you're, you're more likely, you know, your body will produce it as it needs to, as, it's, as the demand suggests. And apart from that, with fat, what you have is, well, you know, I have this... Um, you know, this wood stove analogy, and I don't know the degree to which you're, I'm sure you've heard it a few times, but I know the degree to which uh, your keto campers sure have heard it. it. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, I, I, you know, analogy sometimes is an effective way of, of, of getting these ideas across. And so carbohydrates are basically the, the equivalent, you, know, you, you might say, of, um, of metabolic kindling in your diet your whole grains, your brown rice, your beans, your sweet potatoes, blah, blah, blah. You can look upon those as effectively being twigs on your metabolic fire. They burn fast and hot, right? Uh, and then, but they need to be replenished pretty often. White rice, white potatoes, white bread, um, you know, things, you know, crap like that, basically. Those are basically like crumpled up paper on your metabolic fire. And then your sugary beverages and, uh, and high carbohydrate alcohols and, and things of that nature, uh, juices and what have you, those are basically like throwing gasoline or lighter fluid on that metabolic fire. Now, if all you had to heat your house with was a wood stove and all you had to run that wood stove with was kindling, well, I mean, you could certainly do it. And metaphorically, that is what 99% of our culture, you know, is doing every single day. But what is that really setting up? You know, if, if all you have are twigs and paper to run your wood stove with, um, what are you actually doing? You're sitting in front of that wood stove all day long, and you're constantly preoccupied with where the next handful of fuel is going to come from in order to keep that fire going. And God forbid you should, you know, you, you know, you've got your three meals a day, then you've got your snacks and you've got, you know, whatever else you're having to be on top of it because blood sugar burns fast and hot and then it goes out and it needs to be replenished. And so, uh, and you know, you play that game long enough and that the feedback loops get mixed up and, you know, people start to develop, uh, insulin resistance and, um, and then you really, it takes, you know, you, you end up really getting uh, imbalances in that, in that equation. And ultimately, 
uh, you know, your energy is like this, your cognitive functioning is like this, your mood is like this. Uh, and so what is the alternative to that? Well, what if you were to take a nice big fat log and put that on the fire? Well, now basically you're free. You go about your business. You know, you can sleep all the way through the night. Hey, and there's an analogy here. Um, and you wake up in the morning instead of 3 a.m. with freezing to death. You wake up in the morning. It's, oh, yeah, you know, that log is burning down. I better throw another one on there. And then you just go about your business. I, I basically refer to it as a state of metabolic freedom, which I think is a legitimate term. I don't think there's really any such thing as metabolic flexibility. I, I hear some people use that term, and I think it is in great marketing, but it, it isn't necessarily couched in reality because really fundamentally, you're primarily either going to be a fat burner or a sugar burner, and you may have some limited ability to do both at any given time. But it takes, if you want to be, have a fully adapted fat-based metabolism, you really kind of have to stick to that in order to maintain the benefits of that. And if all you're doing is kicking out, you know, uh, eating a bunch of carbs one day and then doing going carb free for another couple of days and you kick up a bunch of ketones, that doesn't mean that you're using them efficiently. It really takes time and, and effort and, you know, weeks and for some individuals, possibly months, depending on their situation, to arrive at a fully adapted state of effective ketogenic adaptation. I, that's the terminology I use, and I abbreviate that as EKA, effective mm -hmm. ketogenic adaptation. It's not about just, it's not like more ketones are better. You know, there are a lot of ketone supplements. I'm not a fan. I, I do think that there's a place for the ketone esters and definitely a, a very legitimate place for those. And I'm actually a fan of, of that for certain applications. But, you know, the ultimate goal, and even Frank Yosa of, of Ketone Aid would tell you, Ultimately, the goal is to have effective keto ketogenic adaptation on your own, not to keep having to take a supplement all the time. So, um, so ultimately, you know, if it takes that long, you know, you can boot yourself out of ketosis with a high glycemic, you know, meal. And it, it, there are people that will, you know, decide, well, it's Christmas time. I'm just going to, you know, just cheat a little bit. And there are people that say, oh, you can have cheat days. Not really, not not if you really want this. Um, uh, that doesn't really fit into the equation well. You really do need consistency. I'm not saying that you can never have a bite of a sweet potato ever again or anything. A lot depends on who you are. You know, what your state of health was before all of this, what your metabolic state of health, what your immunologic state of health is. Um, all these things factor into the decisions that we make day to day in terms of what uh, you know, just how strict you want to be with this whole thing and what exceptions you can make when. Um, but the fact of the matter is that for people that are metabolically compromised, you know, they're, they're going to need to make a choice. And that's really, you know, the reality of it. It may not be what people want to hear, but you really do kind of have to pick and choose what it is that you want. And you can't have it both ways. I know everybody wants to think all you have to do is drink this you know, receive a ketone supplement and I can be in ketosis and still have my cake too, you know? And no, you really kind of can't. You really kind of can't. Um, so my approach, which, um, you know, I, I found myself increasingly, I was the first person, by the way, within the ancestral health uh, genre, way back when, back in 2008, 2009, when all this stuff was sort of emerging. I was the first person within that movement to to promote a, a, a you know a fat-based ketogenic approach to metabolism, and back then it was I was pretty marginalized for that. You know, I mean, I made my splash, and certainly Primal Body, Primal Mind made a big impression on a lot of people, and I it gave me a platform. But a lot of the big dogs and the better marketers <laughs> than I am, you know, kind of poo-pooed that, you know, and they just said, "Yeah, just eat real food, and it's all good," and I, I have never uh, relinquished my position, mainly because I have never found a sound scientific reason, um, a, you know, sound evidence-based reason uh, to change that message. I have found ways of expanding on that, and uh, I found plenty in the in the meantime 
to greatly support what I was saying back in 2009. Um, and of course, that caught the attention of all the people that had been poo-pooing me for a while. And then all of a sudden, I've, I'm being, I've got, you know, trample marks all over me, where they're now racing to put out their keto, you know, programs and things like that. And, uh, you know, because it's, it's the thing du jour. And it's like, well, no, I mean, there, there's a lot to know about this. And a lot of the quick start programs and different things out there, you know, look, there are almost as many ways of eating a so-called paleo diet as there are people claiming to practice them. And there are also similarly almost as many ways of eating keto as there are people to practice them. And they are not all created equal. They're not all focused on health. They're not all necessarily focused on something that can be sustainable for a lifetime or affordable for a lifetime. Um, a lot of them aren't even based on real food. They're just based on a bunch of supplements and, you know, or then you have the, you know, vegan keto things, which I just, I have, I just can't, I can't wrap myself around that. Um, but I know people who, who, who think that way. But regardless, um, I found myself constantly trying to fit myself like a square pig into a, a round hole with my audiences because with those terms now, which have both become heavily commercialized, mm -hmm. uh, I find myself having to constantly distinguish what it is that I am doing that is unique in all of that and consistent uh, in all of that. And, um, and I found myself kind of gradually distancing myself from some of those terms and instead adopting and literally um, uh, patenting my own term, which I call primogenic, to kind of hybridize the ideas between ancestral and, and, and ketogenic principles uh, geared entirely toward optimization, health optimization, utilizing, you know, uh, uh, you know, life extension, you know, research, longevity research, and anti-aging kinds of things that uh, fit very well with some of these concepts. And also, I, you know, as a practitioner and a, a functional health practitioner, um, I've developed a lot of expertise in the arena of autoimmunity, and that's an, a really you know, powerful area of strength for me. So I understand those concepts in, in the equation and I fold them into the equation. In reality, nobody can fold them in perfectly because AIP programs are yeah, a little too overgeneralized. But um, I take that into account, you know, more than just about anybody. Um, and I also take into account the, so many other things that, that challenge us in our modern world. The, you know, the world that we live in today is so dramatically different than the world of our prehistoric ancestors. Um, we have challenges that we face in, in our modern industrialized environment that are unprecedented in all of our evolutionary history. We are dealing with a level of toxicity in our air, water, and food supply. We're dealing with GMOs. We're dealing, you know, with all kinds of things. And people tend to not take those things into account when formulating an approach that is going to help compensate for that. And that's very much on my mind. One other thing I would like to kind of point out um, that I've observed that I think is really important to know and understand is that, you know, as a, as a species that evolved in the wild, we, um, we're wired for being alert to tangible threats in our environment, you know? It, it, saber tooth cat jumps out from behind a bush and starts chasing you around, that's pretty tangible. You know, you're, you're getting uh, trampled by a herd of woolly mammoths, you know, that's pretty tangible. There's a warring tribe coming into your camp or a major storm or a big seasonal change or even something like a, a famine or seismic activity or, you know, a volcanic eruption or whatever we're alert to those kinds of things and we recognize them as tangible threats to our survival and our safety. And we know instinctively that we have to take action to do something to protect ourselves. Well, in our modern world, we've eliminated a lot of those, um, those tangible threats from the way we live. We live in comfortable climate controlled environments. It's always 72 degrees. Even if you're living in Minnesota in February, it's 40 below and the wind is howling outside, 
winter ain't coming for you anymore, you know? Um, you know, we're, you know, we don't have to take more than a couple steps in any direction to be able to grab a handful of something we call food, you know, that we trust that, you know, it says food on the label, so it must be, shove it into our faces and, you know, swill it down with a beer and call it good. Um, and, you know, the life that we lead is, is enormously unnatural in that, in that respect. And we're kind of, our senses are dumbed down. We don't, we're not really alert to dangers anymore because the ones that we're most wired for kind of aren't happening unless you walk out in the middle of a street and there's a city bus hurtling in your direction. Okay, you know to be alert to that. But from that standpoint, our environment isn't as dangerous as it used to be. What threatens our health and actually our very uh, future as a species now are nearly universally things that are not visible to us. It is pollutants in our air, water, and food supply. It is depleted soils. It's genetic, genetically modified whatever crap. It's adjuvants in injectable medical procedures. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, it's electromagnetic frequency pollution, right? Now, God forbid, 5G, um, you know, and it's it radiation contamination. All of these things in microplastics everywhere in our oceans and whatever, all of these things pose extraordinary risks to us. And we've never been more burdened from more sides with more things that are endangering our health and survival. And yet we've never been more oblivious to any of it. And we're just not wired to care. So it takes a conscious decision to recognize that the real threat lies in the things you can't necessarily see. And unfortunately, there are a lot of vested interests that are intent on, on uh, controlling your perception about these things. And unless you're willing to be your own citizen journalist and are willing to do the homework and to go to the most you know, reliable, credible sources of information that are independent in nature, right? Uh, and uh, independent journalism, independent science, um, that is well referenced and, you know, and all of that, um, you know, you're a little bit at the mercy of whatever way the wind happens to be blowing. You know, you watch TV and you'd think that certain, you know, certain drugs and certain, you know, uh, you know, junk foods and whatever are like the greatest thing ever. Look how natural everybody's smiling and running through fields of flowers. Isn't this great? And then the next thing you do is you pick up a, you know, a, you know, a book like mine and you're like, oh, well, none of those things are good. What? You know, I don't blame people for being confused. I don't blame them for being jaded. So two things you have to do. Number one, you have to try to find the quality independent science where there are not vested interests involved, which is increasingly hard. And where you don't have that, looking at our, at our evolutionary history and using common sense to extrapolate what would have been natural to us as an evolving species, you know, what kinds of things make sense in that context. Um, one of my greatest strengths is knowing how to connect dots. And um, I, in order for me to support any hypothesis, it's not just the science that has to be there or the, or, or the you know, the science of human anatomy and physiology, um, not just the studies, but, you know, does this, does this jive with how our body's actually designed? Does this make sense in the context of what our bodies actually require and don't require, you know, as, as well-established principles? Um, you know, does this make sense um, from an evolutionary standpoint? And if it doesn't meet these litmus, you know, markers, then to me, I, I have to put it on a back burner. I have to disregard it because these things have to intersect in order for me to say, you know, I think that this, there's a very high probability that this is right on. And so that's how I go about, and it's painstaking. And I, I live my life traveling through rabbit holes. Um, I don't just that, I, you know, I start out with a, one, with, with a small handful of questions and I end up with more and more with every step I take and I, and I look up, okay, they, they said this statement, I need to look that up, I need to figure out what that's based on, is that based on anything solid? Oh, and look, this just came up and oh, okay, I, you know, and I just dig and dig and dig until I get down to bedrock. And well, yeah. 
I was going to say that makes you one of the most brilliant researchers that I've ever studied, although it doesn't sound that great at times, but that's a, yeah. a testament to the work that you have put, put in your books. I, yeah. I have a question, speaking of which, have you been connecting any dots um, with what's going on in the world with the coronavirus and oh, the yeah. pandemic? Yeah, I've actually put close to 300 hours into that. And I mean, wow. of obsessive effort like just not like even forgetting to eat or sleep or you know go to the bathroom or anything and i'm just sitting there and i'm i am going you know i people are sending me youtube videos every day and it's this person Same. says this and that person yep. says that and it's like you know okay some of these are better than others but the fact is unless there is solid journalism and then unless they're giving me referential material from you know, from reasonably credible sources that I can dig and I can go into myself, find myself and, and do the background checking on and then do the background checking on the background checking. I'm not going to embrace any particular idea until I have done, you know, my due diligence, which I take almost too seriously. I've been criticized by, by business advisors for taking that sense of responsibility a little too seriously. Um, but I, I don't do this for the money per se. I mean, obviously if we can't make a living, then what's the point? <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, it's like the last thing on my mind as evidenced by my bank account. Um, it's like when I wake up, I am obsessed with, you know, where can I find the best possible information to answer this burning question? And I am going to dig relentlessly like a freaking pit bull until I find it. And yes, I have found quite a lot. And in fact, so much, I have a keynote presentation, which I could never possibly give uh, at this point with 600 slides ready to go, <laughs> you know? And every one of those slides having documented information, you know, that is, you know, that anybody can cross check, that anybody can go in and, you know, and, and, and just say, well, yeah, I can't argue with that. That's a fact, right? Um, with 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 the you know math based on actual numbers and not projected numbers and all that kind of a thing, and I mean, yes, I've come to quite a number of conclusions from all of this. I actually decided that I was going to put out the information in a series of reports and resources, and I actually have a page for that. If you go to my regular website, primalbody-primalmind.com or primalcourses.com where I sell my online uh, programs. Y you put, if you put in, in, in my regular, uh, actually my regular uh, uh, website, website, yes. You put in your email address. Um, I will send within five minutes, I'll send you a link to my first preliminary report, which is close to a hundred pages. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I, I rewrote that so many times, man, I can't even, because the places I wanted to go with that were not necessarily where people were gonna be ready to go with that. Mm -hmm. And I realize how overwhelmed everyone is and how beaten down and disempowered and made to feel helpless everyone is in this. We're all being compartmentalized away literally, uh, not just figuratively as usual. And, uh, you know, so there's certainly some polarization as well, um, but, you know, people are just sort of left to scratch their heads and not know what to believe and they're overwhelmed and there's a lot of fear. Um, some of it's justified and some of it is frankly not justified. Um, and I realized that what people actually needed was something that was going to help them feel, uh, give them positive, actionable, solid, um, you know, well-researched information that was going to be able to help them wherever they live in this equation, help them figure out how to best optimize their, their health and immune function from a foundational standpoint, and not just a bunch of supplements, but there is a legitimate place for supplements in all this too. A lot of us need shoring up, and it's really hard to do it all with food anymore. Um, and, and then on top of that, you know, I, I, I really wanted to take a very constructive approach that was going to leave people feeling empowered at the end. And I am proud to say overwhelmingly, that is the feedback I have gotten. People are like, Oh my God, I, I can finally sleep nights. I feel so much more empowered. Um, this was really, really, really helpful to me. It wasn't just a bunch of fear mongering one way or another. And so there's a rich plethora of information within the report and also in terms of links 
to other uh, good quality, I mean, really high quality journalism, really high quality, uh, credible information in there that people can access that I've very carefully selected as sources of information that people can also use their own common sense and, and discretion, you know, to, uh, to make use of. And some of these, of course, have already been taken down by YouTube. So I'm constantly on top of what's happening with these sources. And I have found, thus far, I think I've found alternative uh, links on, on platforms that are not so heavily censored uh, for all of them. But um, if somebody is a trying to link onto something and they can't, let me know and I'll do my best to find an alternative for you. That's so, fantastic. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I can, I can say. Go <laughs> well, I was going to say that's, that's fantastic. I love that you've done so much research on it. I, I have as well. I haven't put it together in, in such a, a, a hundred page document. So if they go to the website right now, they could, uh, download they could sign up with your email newsletter and they'll get a download of that document is what you're saying they will they'll receive they'll receive uh you know that information within five minutes of signing up it you know it'll you know it'll it'll come to them and um yeah and and it's 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 a pretty rich amount of information i'm adding to it almost daily now i mean yesterday i added two or three pretty big categories you know, like what to do if you actually have somebody in the hospital who's on a ventilator, you know, what do you need to know about that? What are the additional things that a person might need to consider uh, if you have a family member? How do you advocate for them? Because you can't be there in their environment with them, which is one of the most cruel aspects of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know many examples of people who just were completely helpless because the person they loved most was in an environment they weren't allowed in, you know, and um, it's, it's problematic because advocacy is much, much more difficult in that kind of situation. Uh, so how do you make you know, sense of all that? Um, and what is the real science behind, you know, a, a real science of virology, you know, and what do we need to know when it comes to uh, viruses in order to make uh, the best choices here and, and also the nature of these particular viruses, what might we think about the kinds of things that are coming that are, are, are claiming they are going to help fix this problem for us. You know, what are the inherent issues and problems perhaps associated with those that are well documented? And again, I don't throw anything out there as just an opinion based on having watched a half dozen YouTube videos. I do my freaking homework. I mean, to a fault, do it literally to almost my detriment. Um, but I, I take my responsibility to my audience seriously because it's not important so much for me to be right as it is important for me to be accurate in the information that I provide and to really connect the right dots so that people have the information that they need and it's not leading them, not leading them astray because I didn't do my homework. Yeah. And we all, we all get caught in something sooner or later. You know, it's like, oh crap, I forgot to double check on that fact and somebody called me out on that and oh crap i mean you know but i bet you dimes to donuts i do my due diligence more than just about anybody um it's it, you know it's almost an obsession and the fact of the matter is that you know that that report is a free report you know i i, I had people saying well you know you could you could create this thing and you people could sign up and they could pay for it and it's like that felt unethical to me um, because this affects all of our lives and the implications for the future, not just simply of our health, but as our freedom, you know, as our essential freedoms go and everything else. This is the defining issue of, I believe, our, our species right now. And unless people understand it in the best way possible, uh, we're, we have the we run the risk of making mistakes or allowing mistakes to be made. I know there's a whole lot of allowing right now that ought not be happening. That um, you know that we may never be able to come back from. Um, and so it's really important that that people, you know, we all be our own citizen journalists. People do their due diligence. Do your homework it's okay to have a hypothesis about this stuff, but be willing to recognize maybe when you might be wrong and, you know, ask yourself the tough questions, not just everybody else. And, you know, I think anybody who really does their homework in a, in a rational, objective way 
is not going to come to any different conclusion than I've come to here. There's just no possible way. You know, there's, there's the evidence of, um, you know, there's what, there, it, it, there's what you see in the media and, uh, and what's being promulgated by political and health authorities. And then there's what's actually out there in the realm of, of actual science, actual data, actual numbers, uh, the actual, um, uh, there was a briefing by a couple of doctors. The That's Erickson awesome. briefing. Brilliant. It, it, really important. That got taken down. I have a I new know. link up for it. Yeah. Oh, I, great. Oh, yeah. I, I have the new. No. It's like, no, that one's too important. People need to watch that. I, you know, and that's on my site now. You can go and access it. I think that link will be good for a while. Uh, some platforms are far more censored than others. Mm -hmm. And when you watch this and when you realize that it was censored off of YouTube, and it's like the most grounded, sane, I mean, it was ABC News yep. briefing, right? It was, you know, and these Not guys Not controversial were, at all. No, these guys, well, it was from the standpoint of what certain people would like to have us believe about what's actually going on and what we should be doing about it. But these were guys on the front lines who did their due diligence in no small way and who said, look, you know, we are the ER, we are, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're finding out from all the other ER doctors around the country that we're talking to. These are the actual numbers. You can go online, look it up yourself. These are actual data sets. And here's, we're crunching the numbers for you. And this is what the only rational conclusion is from those numbers. And here's what you need to understand about how the human immune system works and all these kinds of things and what, what you know, what is true and what absolutely cannot be true in all of this. And you can't ar really argue with these guys. And there was one jerk who really tried hard to argue with them. I just kind of wanted to slap the guy, but, yeah, the but they, were so, yeah. <laughs> they were so graceful. And, and so, um, you know, they treated everybody, everyone's questions with respect. They qualified everything that they said. There was nothing about anything they said or did to criticize at all. Oh, forgive me. Let me turn that off. So, um, hey, somebody's breaking social distancing rules. They're at our front door. Um, <laughs> cool, and I'm missing it. Um, so you take, anyway. You take a, a quick break? No. Okay. No, there's somebody else who can handle that. Okay. So anyway, um, you, know, if you, you know, if you download my, my uh, report, you know, you're going to feel like you have an excellent handle on the health side of things. Uh, and you're also going to get, a, you know, you're going to get some commentary from me toward the end that I think is also, you know, um, you know, based on well-documented uh, evidence. And, uh, and then you're going to see a whole host of resources you are going to be so glad you had access to. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much for putting that together. Uh, you're yeah. going to help so many with that. I I'm going to read that today. Cool. Uh, I didn't know about the document. I'm going to read it as soon as we're done here. Awesome. Um, we have a few minutes left. You know, it's hard. This is just, it's hard to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it to you anyways. Uh, let's say we have this conversation a year from now, uh, April, May, 2021. Hopefully we won't all still be. You know. Yeah, hopefully we're, yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's part of the question. Like what, what do right. you see happens in the world what, what what does the world look like a year from this a year from now from this conversation oh god it's a terrifying question i ask myself uh at, you know at, at three o'clock in the morning because there's only really one of two ways this is going to go um things are not going to go back uh you know if if, if we leave everything be the way we're told the thing should be and and we follow all the rules and we obediently you know in lockstep you know, um, you know, get herded along with all of this as most people seem willing to be. What's going to happen a year from now that things will never go back to normal, that there will, uh, that, that uh, there will be a much more authoritarian uh, uh, nature of government in place that will be requiring you to do certain things, whether it, if, if, uh, whether it offends your belief systems, whether it offends uh, your sense of what's healthy or not, you may not be, you, you know, you may not have choices anymore. Uh, if you want to be part of society in any way, shape, or form, you may be forced to do certain things that nobody should be forced to do um, that completely contradict not only things like the Nuremberg Code, Nuremberg Code, but also uh, that completely contradict everything that is supposed to be true about our Constitution, our Bill of Rights as, as Americans, but also fundamental inalienable human rights, all of that is subject to suspension right now. 
And uh, that is not going to improve. Uh, we're all being asked to walk around wearing masks increasingly, even though the, uh, the data set just simply does not support that. And in fact, those masks may do more harm than good to healthy people. Uh, and they're not, you know, and if you're, if you're unhealthy and you're out, you know, you shouldn't be out, you know, stay home, take care of yourself and, or take care of your vulnerable, you know, elderly, you know, loved ones who may be frail or, you know, I worry way more, frankly, about a 40 year old that's living on beer and Twinkies than I worry about. I, I, I know right now a woman who is 105 years old and she's healthier than most 50 year olds that you know. All the lights are on everybody's home. She is just full of piss and vinegar and she's awesome. And she, full mobility, everything. I don't worry about her at all, man. She's fine. It's, it's you know, uh, so the relative state of, of, of risk is, is relative, right? It's, it depends on who you are. But if, you know, you're somebody with asthma, you're somebody with COPD or some other form of, of breathing impairment that is not necessarily infectious related, um, masks are contraindicated. And there are stores, there's a, a local grocery store that's saying, now as of, actually, I think it's as of today, you will now be required to wear a mask in the store. Either you bring your own or you can buy one for five bucks when you walk in or, you know, whatever. Um, I called and let the manager know that I would not be shopping there anymore. Plenty of places you can still go to get food and different things you need without having to walk into an environment like that. And I think it's important not to just not support those businesses, but to let the managers know why you're not supporting mm -hmm. them. Um, let them know why, that the science simply does not, even the WHO says that masks are ineffective, you know, to protect you if you're a healthy person, that they're not going to do very much. Uh, but they are potentially putting you at risk in multiple ways. Um, I have a marvelous interview with Dr. Judy Mikovits, who's a, mm -hmm. is a good friend of mine, actually. Oh, she's uh, brilliant. One of the great heroes of all time. And she, this is an NIH, you know, virologist. This is a world-class virologist. She, it's her research that's the reason that people with HIV are able to live reasonably normal lives now and don't die of AIDS anymore. That's her research. Uh, she worked for the National Cancer Institute for more than 30 years and all of that. This is somebody who's done groundbreaking research, is one of the most accomplished scientists of, 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 of her time. And um, she can tell you all about this. She actually worked at Fort Detrick with Ebola, you know, in the labs there. She knows what this type of virus is all about. She, can, she understands the science behind it. She can explain it beautifully. And she will tell you that masks, that she will never wear a mask and healthy people should not be wearing masks. You know, if, if you're healthy, and you don't have, you know, you don't have a respiratory, you know, you, you don't have a cold or flu or whatever. Um, you can cough right on almost anybody and it's not going to give them anything, you know. Um, and um, the fact is that, you know, our immune systems don't, don't get strong by running away from germs. Our immune systems don't get strong in an environment, uh, in a sterile environment. Our immune systems are strengthened through exposure. And yes, there will be a certain percentage of people that will have, you know, an adverse, you know, uh, you know that will develop adverse symptoms. An extremely minute number of people um, may end up having to be hospitalized or may end up, you know. But in the end, um, the society as a whole is not served through what's happening. And it's not indicated, you know, in, in the past, you really only, if, if there was, a, you know, an epidemic or pandemic, you quarantined the ill, right? You're supposed yeah, to, yeah. not everybody. And the tens of millions of lives that have been destroyed now, unnecessarily as a result of this, uh, of this insane measure that's not based in science at all. Um, you know, initially, maybe it made sense because we, nobody knew what they were. I mean, I was rolling my eyes from day one, but, but, but you know, initially the data wasn't quite in yet. Nobody knew people were afraid. So they took some extreme measures, but as the data has emerged from all of this, now it is abundantly clear that this is not an effective measure that it, we're, it's doing far more harm than good. Many, many millions more people will die as a result of the way in which this is being handled than by, than this virus could ever possibly do. Um, your rate, your risk of dying, uh, 
you know, from, from this virus, um, the average person's risk of dying from this virus is less than being struck by lightning. That's, that's how not scary it is. But that's not what's in the news. That's not what's in the media. The, many of the world's top immunologists have, uh, and there are, uh, there are a couple of different documents out there, um, which I'm not even sure I got those on my thing yet. I should put those up. Something like 22 of the world's top infectious disease scientists and virologists and public health specialists and whatever else uh, with, with unassailable credentials are saying, this is collective suicide. This is insane. There's, there's no reason for us to be doing things the way we're doing them. The data simply does not support it. But instead, uh, and, and with the numbers going down and whatever else, now the measures seem to be tightening even more, more requirements for masks, more requirements for toxic hand sanitizer, which by the way, is just does a really shitty job of protecting anything. And you're more likely to you know, get cancer than you are to protect yourself from anything, from those, a lot of those toxic um, compounds. And God forbid you're using Lysol, which doesn't protect you against anything, uh, more likely to give you and your family cancer. Um, all of these things that we're kind of scared into doing. Everybody's Howard Hughes, and that's the new normal. You know, we need to make some decisions about what we're willing to accept and what we're not. Right now, lockdown is the law of the land only because we accept it as such, um, because we're willing to go along with it. Uh, and it's a very minute number of people telling us that everybody has to do things this way and the evidence does not support it. So, you know, it, it's really a choice we make as to whether we comply or whether we exercise rational uh, civil disobedience, honestly. Um, and, you know, as a human species, uh, I would rather die than live a life that is not human, you know, um, that does not allow me uh, to hug and, and kiss the people I love and to shake hands with people I meet you know, because human touch is as much a nutrient, I'm here to tell you, as is air, water, or the food that you eat, um, and where is sunshine. Touch is something fundamental to our species. We're a tribal social species, and we are healthiest um, mentally and physically in connection with one another, and we're at our best in connection one, with one another. And right now, we're not, we are not uh, being allowed uh, to do that. And that to me is the real, you know, genocide in, in all of this, to use a strong term, but I don't know what else to call it. Um, you know, uh, my partner listens to s police bands, you know, here and there. I mean, you got to find something to do, right? <laughs> and just to be, you know, out of curiosity, what's happening around town? And it's, it's, it's insane. It's just crazy. The majority of the calls are not you know, yeah, there's smash and grab crimes. People are getting desperate. Um, you have people who are starving and they're trying to figure out how they're going to feed their families. And so you have uh, more people, want, you know, more civil unrest, more people wandering around uh, committing petty crimes and things like that out of desperation. But for the most part, what call after call after call uh, in the, that the local police are being asked to deal with has to do with mental health breakdowns, you know, people just losing it, um, domestic violence, suicide attempts, and successful su suicide attempts. That's where, you know, police action is going, you know, where, the, where, the, where all their time is being spent is trying to keep people from losing their minds. Um, that's the real public health crisis. Many more people are at risk for that right now. And uh, it's, it's a real concern. And, um, you know, anybody that thinks that that is yeah, an irresponsible thing to point out has not done their homework. They have simply not looked at the objective available data. They're watching way too much CNN. You know, turn TV off. That's one of the first things I tell you is you've got to turn the mainstream media off. And... Um, because that's probably the least healthy thing you're doing for yourself right now. Yeah. You know, I, I know we're past our time. Do you have another five or 10 minutes? Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, I, I, I was um, obese for a large portion of my life, 24 years of my life until I got my act together, but I was suicidal growing up. Yeah, me and too. I, 
Oh, yeah. oh really? Been there, brother. Oh, yeah. So I, I believe that if, if I was going through that dark place right now, when I didn't, where I don't have my sports, my outlets, my friends, I, I would have taken my life. So what you just shared resonates with me. And it really, it's, it's such a shame that so many people do not see what's going on with the mental health breakdowns, the suicide attempts, the suicides that's right. happening every single day. And my question to you is this now, because I'm actually getting Dr. Buttar on my show in a, in, a, in a week. And I know that you know his work because if you're familiar with Dr. Yeah, Judy, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask him this question. If we don't accept that, if we don't accept what they want to do to us, what, what do we do? What, what, what do we do to stand up and, and fight for our right to be free? What, well, what we number actually- one, we still have an illusion of having such a thing as a constitution and bill of rights here in the United States. It's different in different countries in terms of what people believe their fundamental rights are within the context of their own governments. But we have that here. And as long as we have the illusion of having it, we need to exercise those rights. We don't just get to sit there with it, you know, and say, hmm, I mean, we've got to be activists. We have to reach out to our public officials and let them know where we stand on these issues. You know, um, look, if, if, if somebody you know, thinks a coronavirus vaccine is going to be a good thing, which by the way, it is probably going to kill many more people than it saves. Um, RNA vaccine, RNA vaccines are the most dangerous one. Dangerous ones out there have never been tested on humans. Uh, there's a small trial going on up in Seattle. I guarantee you, we're not going to hear all the details of that. Um, but there, no, no animal testing with the current vaccines. Um, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting minority of people that stand to profit the most handsomely from um, from what is coming in that regard, and who are who are pushing the hardest and who are most responsible actually for for what's happening right now, and uh, you know they don't have any liability in any of this. If you, you you take that vaccine, you're forced to take that vaccine, and you die, or you're injured in some um, irreparable way, you have n- you have no recourse. You have no they have no liability at all. Um, you really want to be forced to put something in your body that wasn't even tested on a gerbil, you know, uh, much less, much less, you know, uh, a healthy human body or a compromised uh, human body. Uh, you know, we really should have a right to have informed consent. We should have a right to, uh, to say yes or no to anything that involves putting something into our bodies. Um, we we should have a right to say yes or no based on uh, our own situation, what we feel is an acceptable risk, uh, or you know, or a range of benefits we think we might want, and those rights could be taken away from us. And I'm not saying that nobody should you know ever do anything with that. What I'm saying is that you know we all should agree that everyone has a right to choose. And uh, really, if you choose to get, uh, you know, vaccinated, then why are you so afraid of somebody who's not, if it's so great, right? Mm -hmm. So um, at any rate, I I think that that we need to, number one, uh, contact our our local legislators uh, as much as possible, have, um, and, and be very, very clear about what it is that we, you know, are, are willing and are not willing to do. And the other thing is that we may need to exercise civil disobedience um, and simply say no. I mean, what if tomorrow everybody just walked out their front door and went back to work and, you know, and, you know, reopened their businesses and went over to their friends' houses and whatever else. I mean, in some places they're like, well, you know, you can be fined $1,500 and spend 30 days in jail. Are, you know, are they going to do that if 10,000 people, you know, decide to just enough is enough? Um, I, I think that, that uh, a lot is going to depend a year from now on whether or not we've decided to take responsibility for our own lives and, and health and well-being or not, or whether we're just, willing to hand it over to somebody else to tell us what is going to make us safe. I think it was um, uh, Benjamin Franklin that said that, uh, you know, security without liberty is prison, Mm -hmm. you know, by definition. Mm -hmm. And this is what 
this is what we all have right now. And, and we don't, we, and frankly, we don't have either, you know, we, we just have prison. Um, um, you know, social distancing does not work as advertised. Uh, isolation and lockdown does not work as advertised. Um, it, it, it it's, it's not, it's no longer, it no longer makes sense in the context of what the data is showing us about what this virus is all about. And so um, um, people are just simply going to have to reach into their own um, consciences and they're gonna have to do their homework. Uh, and, you know, I don't consider uh, an educated an opinion, uh, an educated opinion and an uneducated op opinion to be on equal footing. You know, lots of people spewing their opinions, but until you've done your homework, um, you know, uh, you, you, you know, <laughs> not all opinions are created equal. Well, call to action for the keto campers is what Nora just said, reach out to your local legislators and let them know this is not okay, that you want freedom you want the ability and it's not even about because this is gonna i imagine it's going to upset some people talking about vaccinations but it's really not about pro-vaccination or anti-vaccination it's about the freedom to make a decision whether you want it or not that's what it's about it's the freedom and if right you and, and right and and based upon i mean informed consent right, right. Right, um, because that's not what people are being given they're just being told this is mandated and that's that and you know, most people, um, frankly, have not done their homework on that issue. And, and it is a complex, right now, actually, uh, there is uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Truth About Vaccines series. Mm -hmm. And even though it's playing out, the last couple of episodes of that um, are entirely based upon what's happening now. And so, um, forgive me. And so I urge people to, because that is one of the most grounded uh, rational, respectful, uh, really objective views of a vaccine I've, I've ever gotten an education about ever this through that particular docu series, and even though they've kind of gone, been going through it the last week or so, they're going to have a free replay weekend, and I, I really urge people to get squeeze as much of it in as they possibly can um, because it it it, it will really literally will be the best education you've ever gotten on the subject. Yeah, there's a lot to know. It's not a simple thing. So, um, but anyway, yeah, there's there's a lot of, you know, it's hard to learn about anything in an in an environment of censorship, and uh, you know if, you know, why would you censor anything if if you know if the science is so subtle? Why can't we discuss all of this? Why can't we have a rational discussion? Where discussion is not allowed is where we need to become suspicious. And, um, you know, we see this in all, in all areas, really, I mean, of, um, you know, of health and science and, and, you know, environment and all kinds of things. And uh, increasingly, we need to learn to look behind the headlines or, or look past them and, and do the due diligence. Yeah. That's right. And you put together a document for somebody to do that. So what's the website for that again? primalbody-primalmind.com and you just go and put in your email address. I swear I'm not going to abuse, you know, your email address. I'm not one of those people that sends out an email every day and, you know, I, I only send out a newsletter when I really have something to say. Uh, I usually have a better than 50% open rate on my newsletters because people know, oh, Nora's got something to say. Really yeah, good. it's yeah. really good. Um, yeah. And so, um, and, uh, you know, I respect your privacy and all of those things. You know, I, I take a very respectful approach to everything that I do, but I also don't tend to pull too many punches. I will tell you what I think, and I won't, um, you know, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I don't dance around issues too much. You know, I'm, I'm, and I will state myself honestly, and only if I, if I have done my homework. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Nora, um, well, first of all, I encourage the keto campers to go check out the links down below of the YouTube video and the podcast. We'll put her website, we'll put her books in there. Uh, I really I admire your work so much. And this conversation yeah. is so powerful. 
especially right now in the world. So thank you for the years and countless hours of research that you put into this and that you continue to do so. Thanks. That's blessed my life, Nora, mm -hmm. and those who I am grateful to educate as well. And uh, I had so many other questions we didn't even get to because it was such a powerful conversation. I want to talk oh, there'll about. There'll be another day. You know? Right. Brain health, autoimmune. <laughs> we'll do it. Oh, we'll, sure. we'll, We'll do it again. I, I think this conversation was perfect. So thank you so much for coming You're on the so podcast. You're so welcome. And I do want to comment that in my report, I definitely talk about the role that ketosis might have to play in, in, you know, in, in your immune function throughout all of this, and particularly when it comes to viral-related issues. So you'll, you, know, you can look for that. Awesome. I can't wait but to I, read that. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and, uh, and talk to you. I appreciate you. And again, give a shout-out real quick to Laura, who uh, helped me... Uh, Get, get you on the show. Laura, you're awesome. Thanks for uh, connecting me up with Ben. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's been long overdue, I think, and uh, really Absolutely. appreciate you doing that. Thank you, Laura Painter.